All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, I'm not going to say this evening because I know for some of you it's the morning. Um, welcome to On Black Ecologies. Um, this roundtable Q&A keynote session um, is being co-organized with the Black Ecologies Initiative at Arizona State University, uh, which is a node in the Political Ecology Network. Um, JT Rowan is our moderator today. Um, he is assistant professor of African and African American studies at Arizona State. Um, he received his PhD in history from Columbia University and his BA in African American studies at the University of Virginia's Carter G. Woodson Institute. Um, JT works on black geographies and black ecologies across rural and urban spaces. Um, he leads the Black Ecologies Initiative at Arizona State University's Institute for Humanities Research. And he is the 2020-2021, that's a tongue twister, National Endowment for the Humanities Mellon Foundation Fellow at the Schoenberg Research Center for the Study of Black Culture at the New York Public Library. Um, so now um, I will ask everyone who's not speaking to please mute your microphones and that'll reduce feedback. Um, and I will hand over the, the session to JT, and if anybody has questions as we go, remember, please put them in the chat and direct them to everyone. Thank you. So you. Go ahead, JT. Thanks so much, Amber. Um, I want to begin um, just by introducing uh, my wonderful co-panelists. I want to say from the outset, it just feels um, really good to have found a community. Um, I think um, part of what Black Ecologies draws us into, at least in this, um, this body of folks that are before you today, um, it, it's really drawn us into a community. So we're, we're, um, uh, we're glad to be before you and to have this conversation in this context. Um, I want to start by introducing the panelists. Um, we have Daniel Purifoy, who's assistant professor of geography at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Purifoy completed a PhD in environmental politics and African American studies at Duke and earned a BA in English and political science from Vassar College and a JD from Harvard Law. Um, Purifoy's current research traces the roots of contemporary environmental conditions in the US South, um, specifically in black towns dating back to the post bellum era. Um, Justin Holsby um, is assistant professor of anthropology at Emory. His interdisciplinary ethnographic research explores the, uh, the cultural and political economy of race and racism in the U.S. Gulf Coast and Mississippi Delta. Um, and he's focusing on the ways that Southern Black communities articulate insurgent modes of citizenship. Um, Hilda Llorens is cultural, also a cultural anthropologist and a decolonial scholar based at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and the thread that binds Dr. Llorens' scholarship is understanding how racial and gender inequality manifests itself in cultural production, nation building, and access to environmental resources, as well as exposure to environmental degradation. Um, Dr. Yoren's research has been centrally concerned with critiquing structural inequalities and dismantling uh, taking for granted notions of power. Um, Carlos Garcia Quijano is Associate Professor of Anthropology in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology in the Department of Marine Affairs at the University of Rhode Island. His research focuses on the dynamic and evolving relationship between people and the ecosystems they form, um, uh, and the uh, ecosystems they form as part of it, with an emphasis on um, human cognitive culture and society, uh, how those things influence the interaction between people and the non-human environment, as well as who bears the impacts and the responsibility for environmental problems. Um, so you can see that we're uh, quite a uh, interdisciplinary cast here, and I think um, also many of us are also involved in certain kinds of work um, to on the ground. So maybe that might also come um, come up as we have this discussion. I want to I want to start by um, posing a question, and I think we can at least to begin we can go in the order of the um, program, the names as I just um, said them. But I want, could everyone just tell us just a little bit more about your work um, around Black ecologies, help us to sort of set the scene. Um, and um, could we start with Danielle? 
this one. Oh, there we go. Okay, sure. Thanks so much, JT. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you who are um, who are present with us that we kind of can't see. Um, can I ask just real quickly how much time we have for this kind of first portion? I have some slides, but don't want to like take up too much time. Um, I think we have a good 10 minutes if you'd like to. Um, okay. Sufficient. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just share with you. Um, Let's see. Um, so kind of my starting place, I think, for this conversation um, was a lot of uh, work that I had been um, doing uh, in the South around environmental racism and questions of environmental justice. Um, and one of the things that I kind of noticed that went um, was going largely unspoken in um, the literature and environmental racism is um, the extent to which a lot of the extractive industries um, that were overburdening Black communities were specifically in historic uh, Black-founded towns and communities. And those that, um, a lot of them that date back um, even to the antebellum era, but certainly in the postbellum era and then sort of in kind of waves of 20 to 30 years um, subsequently. Um, and so that kind of realization um, in my research really kind of led me to a, um, a starting point of thinking about um, what is a town um, and the kind of roots of town formation and how that relates um, to these kind of critical questions of uh, development and uh, environment um, that I was observing in these uh, historic Black towns. And so my work really takes seriously um, Catherine McKittrick's positioning of the plantation um, as a town, um, you know, with a profitable economic system and local political and legal regulations. Um, and really, as I was um, looking through that work, um, it really started to dawn on me about how um, Black towns were really situated, right? Historic Black towns were really situated in our larger um, spatial imaginary, racialized spatial imaginary um, in our economic system. And I started looking really closely um, at um, a lot of questions around development that were arising um, in Black Town, sort of around the time that I was sort of entering into this work, there was a lot of buzz um, beginning uh, nationwide around the lack of infrastructure and basic tools of development in historic Black places, particularly things like wastewater sanitation, water infrastructure. This came up in particular after in the wake of um, Flint. Um, a lot of folks in the South and in more rural spaces were really pointing out that um, whereas Flint had failed um, uh, intentionally, right, um, sort of sabotaged water infrastructure, um, really places like um, Princeville, North Carolina, uh, which is one of the first Black uh, incorporated municipalities in the United States, um, in some other rural spaces um, in like the Alabama Black Belt had never really had adequate infrastructure to begin with. Um, and so um, part of this uh, really led me to kind of thinking about, well, what what is um, how are towns really formed, right? And, you know, what are these sort of ecological consequences of sort of the capitalist ways that towns are um, created? and uh, really made me understand and kind of uh, pan out, right, to um, larger questions of kind of relational development. And these are um, themes that are pretty prominent in geography um, that uh, don't, haven't really taken up race or questions of race racialization processes uh, as much as I think that they should. And so what you're looking at now is a, um, a map of uh, Princeville, which, like I said, is one of the first incorporated Black towns um, in the United States, but it's directly adjacent to and across the river from Tarboro, uh, which is a historic white town. And it, you know, one of the things that you don't know when you look at the map is that that space used to be all one plantation. 
And um, a lot of black communities, uh, when they were uh, post emancipation, um, yes, there were there are lots of folks who left the South, but a lot of them also um, uh, obtained land, right? And, and, and a lot of times on the same plantations in which they were their um, ancestors were enslaved, which they themselves were enslaved, um, which entered them into a kind of um, continued plantation power relationship, right? With um, adjacent uh, white communities that then became their own municipalities. And so um, this had really dire, not just sort of economic consequences, right? For those communities, but also ecological um, consequences. So Princeville, if you know anything about it, you will know that um, it's um, uh, experienced catastrophic flooding at least seven times right in this over 150 year um, history. Um, and that's because they were intentionally placed on floodplains. Um, it's never been able to develop um, infrastructures and necessary to kind of develop and grow into even a, you know, moderately mid-sized city, right, or town. Um, its population remains around kind of a thousand um, to this day, and that's pretty typical of historic black communities. Um, and so, and you know, in addition to right these sort of um, you know kind of uh, topographical uh, and infrastructural issues, a lot of these black towns, like I've said in the beginning, are also targets um, for hazardous industries. Right, uh, the narrative, the dominant narrative around these places is that they're really um, what's the word, um, that there's nothing there, right? That there are um, unused um, blank spaces um, and, uh, and, and, and furthermore, that they're cheap spaces, right? And so um, that kind of uh, historic, right, um, development and sort of relationship, right, to, uh, to plantation power really, um, if you really trace it, right, kind of leads itself to these sort of justifications for um, hazardous extraction, right, of, um, of those communities. Um, so I'll actually just stop there. There's a lot more um, to say, but I think um, that's kind of the starting point uh, for um, my work and kind of where I enter into this conversation about Black ecologies. Thank you so much, Danielle. Could um could we now um switch to who was next? Uh, Justin. Hold on. Yeah, just uh Justin. Yes. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I think I came to the to Black Ecologies kind of kind of in a circumspect way. Um, initially, I went to New Orleans, Louisiana, to study the way that the charter, the way that the schools had been privatized after Hurricane Katrina. Um, immediately after the storm of Hurricane Katrina, um, all teachers were fired from New Orleans public schools, and as people were still in the Katrina diaspora, essentially, um, the entire school system became privatized into all charter schools. So, since Hurricane Katrina, the majority of New Orleans public schools have been privatized charter schools. And I went to New Orleans in 2013 to begin to study how space and place had been transformed by no longer having neighborhood schools. Because in New Orleans, the way that it works now is that you no longer have neighborhood schools where kids go to schools based on their district anymore or their zip codes anymore. Now the entire system is open enrollment. So in the open enrollment system, that means that kids are going everywhere across the city every day to go to school. So when I went to New Orleans in 2013, my initial goal was to figure out how has space and place been transformed by this kind of destruction of neighborhood schooling? Because I wanted to understand on one level, the political economy of what happened. How did, how did, how did you affect the black work, working classes there by firing every teacher and administrator in New Orleans school at the Katrina? But I also want to know how our neighborhoods kind of rebuilding themselves, black neighborhoods, particularly black working class neighborhoods after Hurricane Katrina. So when I got to New Orleans and began to do my research and, and kind of understand that, I understood that the fight for public education in New Orleans was just one particular node in the fight for the rights of the city of New Orleans, in which there are several kind of tentacles that go out in the ways in which black life are being kind of forcibly um, kind of kept back from returning back to the city, kind of reforming in their communities. So once I got into understanding the role of that in the city, I, I got into political activism and learning about, okay, how are activists thinking through this fight for survival in New Orleans now? Because now the fight for neighborhood schools is part of the fight for survival. And after doing that, I learned that in many ways, 
the key fight for New Orleans is not just, you know, in terms of kind of like the shedding away of the social welfare safety net that happened post Katrina, but also the fact that New Orleans may not even exist as a place in 100 years because Louisiana actually loses every single year 20 miles of coastline. OK, so I understood once I got to New Orleans that part of what the fight for education was with a fight to say as a black working class people, we have a right to be here. We have a right to live here. And also there are kind of some extractive threats, including privatization of schools, including the petrochemical industry. All these things are kind of converging here that are forcing us out of this particular location. And for New Orleans to be such an important black geography, that's how I came to understand really the role of kind of schooling, education, but also race and ecology as they all kind of converge in that site. And I think in my own work, I'm thinking through kind of Clyde Woods' work in terms of the plantation geography, as well as Kathleen McKittrick. But Clyde Woods articulates the Gulf Coast region, particularly the kind of extractive petrochemical industry that lines the Gulf Coast as a plantation geography in and of itself. So in my own work, I'm thinking about, OK, I think in the way I've kind of was, I've, I've been trained in a kind of, you know, a Marxist tradition of political economy um, for the most part. So I've been thinking about the ways in which, OK, we see that schools were privatized. We see this was kind of a neoliberal project. But what are kind of the kind of particularly um, colonial and particularly U.S. Southern ways of thinking through the economy that lend themselves towards neoliberal policies? In a sense, kind of asking what we think of as neoliberalism as kind of a kind of post fordist phenomenon, I think back to Reconstruction and how in many ways in Louisiana in particular, that actually does have a very white populist tradition in Louisiana, despite you know, the, being in the South, there's still kind of this sense that the more of a social safety net that we have, the more that black folks will benefit from that social safety net. And that's why it must be stripped away and shredded in many ways. So part of what I'm thinking through in my work now is how the boom and bust cycles of the petrochemical industry actually in many ways affect the way that black social life, particularly black working class social life, is lived and experienced in the city of New Orleans. Because, for example, in the early 1980s, you know, when OPEC um, kind of put limits on oil production in response to the Iranian revolution, at that point, the Gulf Coast kind of emerged as, oh, my God, you're filling a void of kind of petrochemical extraction now. So Louisiana had a, was a boom cycle in the early 80s, what happened. Then 86, when OPEC kind of up production and Saudi Arabia became flooding the market with oil again, that's when, of course, the, the kind of Gulf Coast kind of shrank back. That's when all of the, the kind of petroleum industry moved from New Orleans to Houston at that point. So the city of New Orleans was kind of left abandoned in that bus cycle of the oil extractive industry. Now, thinking about that in terms of how the shredding of the social state that we saw leading up to Hurricane Katrina can in many ways be traced back to another boom and bust cycle of the oil industry, because in many ways, what happened in the 1980s was that after that kind of boom and bust cycle happened in 86, the black unemployment rate in New Orleans went up to 25 percent. It remained there until Hurricane Katrina. So in many ways, I'm thinking about the ways that the boom and bust cycles of the petrochemical industry are affecting black social life in New Orleans and also affecting the way that we can think through kind of neoliberal policies that emerged in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, so in my work, I do lots of work with mapping because partially what I want to do is I want to understand how do black New Orleanians understand space and place in the absence of neighborhood schools, but also kind of what are the interracial class tensions that emerge in this context now, because we have, have a kind of a post Katrina reality now where even black middle class people are being pushed to the edge. Because they didn't they didn't make it through Katrina safely or easily at all. So part of it is I'm thinking through in the fight over public schooling with what the interracial class tensions are that are emerging to kind of get, you know, get, get kids into certain schools that are better than others and seeing how in this context of open enrollment where we can all go to any school that we want to. How do kind of clusters of kind of class privilege provide avenues for certain kids to get better educations in charter school system that's designed to be egalitarian in the sense that all schools are open enrollment. There's a lottery based system. You can apply to a school and get in. There's no privilege involved. But in many ways, I'm thinking about how the kind of class privileges that are, are that are kind of inherent to the city still kind of structure that particular kind of, you know, value based on value free system of selection. Um, so I think part of what I'm thinking through in my work as well is how do we think through neoliberalism, not necessarily as a kind of a post Fordist phenomenon that kind of kind of reached this kind of crescendo in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan and thinking through the after, the after life of that. But I want to think through the way that the shredding of the social state during post during Recon, the Reconstruction era, how that kind of set the terms for what the, so, the welfare state could be in the South. And I think in Louisiana is very nuanced because, there, as I said, there is a white populist history in Louisiana. But how at the same time, how does that, how does the city, how does the state of Louisiana, how do the politics of Louisiana kind of still structure themselves such that black people are living on the brink and on the edge of 
environmental catastrophe in Louisiana. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sitting with the contradictions of that because in many ways, working class white people also live in these vulnerable areas. They also live in what was called Cancer Alley in Southern Louisiana. So white people are also impacted by this. But I think that's where I'm thinking through both the cultural economy, with the kind of the cultural economy of racism and also the political economy of racism, because in many ways, what happens what I'm what I what I'm arguing in my work is that kind of the release valve that's provided um, through anti-black violence and through the carceral state actually allows white working classes to kind of feel a bit better about their social conditions in this kind of you know tender box of an area. And it puts black life at the brink. And I think that in many ways, I feel that what happened to Louisiana and New Orleans post Katrina is a harbinger of kind of what we're seeing now with the response to the coronavirus in the United States. And I'm writing about I'm thinking about writing about that as well. Just considering the way that that total abandonment of the state that wasn't kind of that wasn't an aberration that wasn't an aberrant act by the state that was really saying no when these catastrophes do happen we're going to kind of retrench ourselves and allow the private industry to come in and kind of rehab the area and what's happened is that when you give that kind of level of power and autonomy to the petrochemical industry in the u.s gulf coast we see this kind of zone of kind of capitalist exception where you see so much environmental degradation you see so much kind of data you see so much kind of you know you have cancer alley happening there as well so you see that people are really being impacted by this extraction in many of the black towns as danielle mentioned in her um in her work exist in southern louisiana as well they are you know really impacted by this as well so Part of my work now is thinking through how the move to privatize schools in New Orleans was just one iteration of kind of a project to privatize, you know, and shred the welfare state, but how the kind of the, the layers of the plantation geography that existed there set the terms for that extraction and how the fight for kind of black survival in New Orleans in many ways is tied to the petrochemical industry, is tied to school privatization, is tied to kind of gentrification as well, and trying to make sense of all of that in a city that's really, you know, the most, as FEMA has kind of noted, is the most vulnerable American city to hurricanes. So that's the context in which I kind of came to black geographies in my work. Thank you so much. We can already start to see the kinds of rich connections between the different um, works that are happening under these rubrics of thinking about black e um, black ecologies and environmental um, degradation, um, you know, both in terms of um, the long histories and the sort of short run um, cl uh, dramatic climactic um, events. So I want to um, turn it over to Hilda, please. We're here right now today. Um, okay, let's see. So I um, wanted to share this image, if it can be, yeah, enlarged. Thank you. Um, this is an image I took on uh, July four fourth, twenty eighteen, which of course is um, Independence Day, and it is a, a holiday in the United States and Puerto Rico. Uh, being a part of the United States, being a colonial territory, um, also gets a, a day off, right? And it's a, a day to celebrate and for families to get together and have barbecues and, and spend time together and so on. So um, my research uh, in, in Puerto Rico's uh, Hobos Bay, and, and this is a, a, a bay that is uh, facing, it's a bay in the Caribbean Sea. And I do research uh, in the Caribbean side of the island, which is the southern part of, of Puerto Rico. Um, and the most people think of Puerto Rico and think of San Juan, which is on the Atlantic North Coast. Uh, the Caribbean side is the southern and southeast parts. Uh, and this is actually where I'm from. So a lot of my work is auto theoretical uh, in that I combined you know, family history with uh, social critique. Um, and my, my um, family, uh, are actually, and in, in my ancestors, um, were brought as enslaved uh, folks to uh, to work in the sugar cane plantations. Um, and my family, uh, post-emancipation, became uh, dispossessed, uh, landless uh, peasants, right? I don't know if you can call, I don't, you know, this notion of landless peasants also has to be examined, but essentially were dispossessed 
folks uh, who were peasants without land. That's who that's who we are, right? And still today, that's that's the condition of uh, my, my family. Um, so my research in the in the Hobos Bay um, is at the nexus of uh, environmental racism and black ecologies. And with this uh, this photo that I took, as I mentioned, on July 4th, 2018, um, I took that photo immediately after I had been I had conducted an interview with uh, the medical director of the local hospital um, there. So I, I was at the at the hospital talking to the medical director before I came to this to visit this lagoon. And what the medical director told me that day, right, was that uh, since this company, this uh, coal power plant, was established here in this particular place uh, in, in the Hobos Bay that he had observed about uh, 170% um, increase in cases of cancer. And this company uh, started operating in Puerto Rico in 2002. And it is a, a coal power plant. It is the only coal power plant that operates in Puerto Rico. Uh, if you, you know, if we think about the history of these plants, this is, um, this plant is opening at the time when other coal plants were shutting down. Right, um, so it's kind of a way to externalize, right? This to 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 you know externalize the coal uh, to the Caribbean. Uh, another plant opened, actually, uh, I think two years ago, down in the Dominican Republic, just down the Caribbean Sea from this plant, and they're also now dealing with a huge pile of of toxic coal ashes too, uh, in their premise and in their communities, in their in their um, territory. So we see that the opening of coal plants in these uh, kind of hinterland Caribbean spaces uh, with all the waste and all the kind of illness illnesses that emerge right from having these things in, in your in your uh, territory. The, the, the thing that I think is significant, I mean, there's a lot of significant pieces here, but one of the things is that the power that uh, this coal plant produces doesn't stay, is not for this community. This, this energy goes to San Juan, mostly right to sustain the kind of um, uh, uh, energy sucking tourism that that the that you know the Caribbean you know produces right. The ener uh, tourism is one of the biggest um, uh, suckers. <laughs> I mean, they suck so much electricity, right? Uh, and, and they waste a lot of electricity. And so, if you think of the Caribbean as a as a um, tourist destination, what we're also having to think about is all the electricity and all the energy and all the, the, the you know, where is all this uh, pollution and contamination ending up, right? So it essentially is ending up mostly in, in a hinterland Black communities. And so in Puerto Rico, uh, there are uh, specific black geographies, black black communities, black ecologies that are that are black, a, a lot like in the southern United States. And so I felt, you know, very much um, uh, very connected to Danielle's presentation as well as Justin's, because this is a community that is emerges out of the plantation ecology. So this is all of these towns uh, in the southeast were actually sugarcane plant plantations that are, of course, now towns, but their their origins are uh, essentially as vast uh, sugarcane plantations. Now in Puerto Rico, what happened was when with these towns uh, shifted from agricultural um, sugarcane, right, from plantation style sugarcane, they started, uh, the government started citing all kinds of uh, dirty or polluting contaminating industries in specific black regions, such as the Southeast, such as the Hobos Bay. So I'm here, here you can see just a, a a little uh, slide, I, I guess, a little view of the coal power plant that opened. This one opened in 2002, but just a mile from this, it's a huge power plant complex, right? Located also adjacent to this lagoon. So I'm not showing that here, but we could actually, if if I pan in a different direction, you, we could see this power plant complex, and that was open uh, in 1974. And before that, uh, actually, this was a, a oil refinery. Uh, the setting of an oil refinery, there's pharmaceuticals, there's a military training camp here. Uh, so there is this um, plethora of contaminating uh, and polluting industries all located in this, you know, 10 mile stretch of island, right? Which of course is a 10 mile stretch of island that is also a black community 
right? Uh, you know, the people who live there are descendants of, of enslaved uh, captives who were dumped here to work. And of course, right, once the sugar cane, uh, you know, one of the tragedies of all of this, as, as we well know, I think here, is that once the uh, plantation agriculture, in, in the case of, of Puerto Rico, uh, you know, shuttered, uh, people were essentially left to fend for themselves, right? So this region also has, you know, uh, as as all black regions in Puerto Rico do, right? Black specific black communities have skyrocketing unemployment rates, right? People just can't find uh, paid employment, right? Because there isn't there isn't uh, options here because all these dirty industries they hire outsiders, right? They don't hire community members to to work in these these industries. Right, so that's uh, what we see is that people experience and suffer um, the negative effects, right, of having these these uh, contaminating industries in their communities, but get none of the benefits. So no no economic opportunities, right, no access to any of the things that would make it if 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 there was such a thing making it okay to be in these communities. They, I don't I don't see the the benefits, and they certainly don't gain the benefits, but suffer all the illnesses, right, and all the 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 um, the issues that come with having these things uh, cited in your community. Of course, these things are cited in these communities without any community participation, right? And so there is uh, no justice here, I think, uh, at really any level. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to briefly show this picture because uh, this is, as I said, was a, a photo that I took immediately after this interview with the medical director of the only hospital in this region, and this hospital serves around 60 to 70,000 people, one hospital, okay? And they're dealing, of course, with increased cancer rates, increased renal dysfunction, increased rates of asthma, right? And 70, about 70,000 people for one hospital, because actually, and a lot like what happened in New Orleans, the austerity uh, politics that have swept Puerto Rico since 2008 uh, shuttered. There were about four hospitals in this region, and there's only one left right now. So all the hospitals have been shuttered, right? So there, so, and when I came uh, to this lagoon to take pictures of the uh, toxic coal ash, I, I was actually initially near the, the toxic coal ash mountain taking photos, but then I noticed that there was a, a, a container ship unloading a raw coal in the port. So I actually walked towards the port to get better views of the unloading of the coal. And uh, the coal that is burned at this, um, this coal power plant comes from Colombia. And uh, I have been to Colombia uh, to to the mine, to the community where the mine in Colombia is located. And in Colombia, this community is a black community. It's an Afro-Colombian community. And so uh, because I work very closely with local activists, uh, we have been calling the route, you know, from the mine to the wayside, we call it the, the uh, route of death or the death route, because uh, from extraction to disposal, what this does is that it leaves a trail of death, right? So in Colombia, when in, when we visited the mine, uh, they the black communities there uh, have been dispossessed uh, in a different way. Uh, what the the way that it works for them is that when coal is discovered under their communities, uh, they're basically just pushed out with. Um, with uh, machines, right? They, they're, they're just asked to leave, basically, and they and they're basically forced to leave. And then uh, diggers come in and just dig everything up, and their community becomes a huge pit, right? Open pit, right? And so one of the things that they they told me in Colombia was that this coal is a blood coal, because or as you know, they they just picked up the bones of our ancestors. They picked up, you know. Everything, our lives uh, are, you know, uh, embedded in the coal that is being burnt, right? To make electricity for tourists or, you know, the, the modern lifestyle, et cetera. So they call it blood, blood coal. And then the indigenous people of Colombia, because uh, there's indigenous communities affect, affected by the mining as well, 
called the call they, they their name for the coal is that it is the bones of the of mother earth so on both right the, the kind of uh, symbolic representation of this coal no matter how you slice it is is quite catastrophic uh, and then of course the burning and the disposing of the coal is quite uh, catastrophic for the communities and uh, you know in every instance from extraction to to disposal we see that the the communities that are affected uh, in the in the majority are actually black communities in the Americas as well as indigenous communities and this is no different uh, in Puerto Rico so I'll stop here I, there's so much more I can say but I'll stop here <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. much. Um, again, I think we're starting to really see the contours of black ecologies as a kind of global, um, as a global thing and a global um, set of processes that connect extraction, violent extraction, dumping. Um, and and I think I want to highlight this from now that move us beyond um, in certain ways, a notion of um, sort of singular climate change and the way that that flattens these kinds of realities across the diaspora where the contours of this kind of violent and ultimately deadly these deadly processes are can't be contained within the notion of just sea level rise or that kind of discussion um so can we turn it over to carlos please Oh, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't want to hijack this with a sympathy or anything, but uh, if I seem distracted, it's because an hour ago I received notice of the death of a really beloved family member. Okay. Uh, but uh, since this person was a person who never gave up and always fought for everything, I thought, you know, I need to do what she would have done. Okay. And uh, go ahead. And talk about and, and you know the, the, the lives of people, etc. Okay, uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, my experience and my interaction uh, with uh, uh, Black Puerto Rican ecologies and Black ecologies uh, came uh, via my work as uh, an ethnographer, as an, an, an anthropologist. Uh, uh, looking at the relationship between uh, coastal ecosystems and people uh, in a variety of areas, but especially the Caribbean and within the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. And uh, from this perspective is that I started to see uh, uh, issues of, of, of Black ecologies and uh, Afro-Caribbean people's relationships with the ecosystem. Okay, and a, a lot of this work I have been doing in the last few years in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jorens. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I have the benefit that she already explained uh, some of the uh, landscapes and, and, and areas that we have been looking uh, at and working with. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what I want to do is uh, uh, start with an anecdote because, again, uh, I approach this from the perspective of, of you know, uh, yes, an anthropologist, yes, a scientist and a theorist, but more than anything else, a field ethnographer trying to privilege how people experience and view the world, uh, uh, how, how try to understand it and trying to just let the words and their experiences speak as much as I as well as I can. Okay, uh, so uh, the anecdote is uh, from the summer of uh, 2018. And uh, Hilda, uh, Jorens and I were collaborating in, in this project. Uh, looking at the use of uh, mangrove and coastal forest uh, resources in the coast of southern Puerto Rico, which is the coastal region that she was talking about a few minutes ago. And uh, so we were doing field work, and part of this field work uh, included just driving around and, and, and finding people who were using resources in these forests in a variety of ways. So uh, we were just, you know, driving uh, uh we had uh following instructions on how to find people who uh who fish for land crabs okay and land crabs uh cardisoma guanhumi or the blue atlantic land crab uh, several names in, in spanish is huelles uh in in in, in portuguese as the uh, caranguejo usa and others so these list land crabs are 
you know, animals that live between the water and land in, in mangroves and coastal forests, right, in, in the Caribbean and parts of the, the Western Atlantic. And in Puerto Rico, they are uh, one of the one of the key forest coastal forest resources that Black Puerto Ricans have, have relied upon, uh, uh, and and use and develop entire cultural traditions and bodies of local ecological knowledge around them. So we are looking for for you know to, to uh, for people who were fishing these land, land crabs. It was land crabbing season. And we come upon a couple, okay, a couple of, of Black Puerto Ricans uh, who were on the side of the road, uh, right next to an area that for the untrained eye, this area would be what they call in, in Spanish a pastizal, which is basically a fallow land, mixed forest, maybe recently abandoned, uh, that people tend to look as unproductive areas, right? Areas that are not being used, areas that uh, don't produce, areas that are abandoned, and so on and so forth. So they are that they're parked. Uh, you know, they they have a car. They park their car right their car right next to this pastizal, the side of the road, uh, adjacent to some mangroves. And the only uh, reason we had to suspect that they were about to engage in actually a very productive activity is that they had or well, the way they were dressed they were rest dressed in a way you know to go into the forested area and also because they had what we knew were some uh, some uh, land grab uh, traps okay and i had some photos but I, I couldn't figure out how to share them so i'm, I'm going to have to paint uh, an, an oral picture of this, okay? So uh, we stop and we start uh, talking to them. And, and in fact, yes, they were about to go enter the forest to, to hunt for some and to fish. They call it fish in the forest or pesca de monte to fish for some land crabs, even though this was in dry land. And uh, so, you know, we were, they invited us to go into the forest with them. And as I, we entered the forest, taking photos or this pastizal, taking photos and making observations and et cetera, an area that for, again, for the untrained eye would be considered to be an unproductive area. There was even some trash lying around or some, you know, even an old refrigerator in one corner and, you know, uh, palm trees and other plant material falling down, some of it alive, some of it dead. This area suddenly, by following from the following, you know, entering it from the perspective of land crabber, right, becomes an alive, productive area, becomes an intimately known area, full of again the caves or the burrows where the land crabs live. There's also other other kinds of crabs, mangrove crabs, uh, coming up the trees and you know up and down the trees making their living. Uh, there's coconut trees of which they also harvested what they were. You know, looking for the land crabs, and uh, and they were you know birds and so on and so forth. It was a productive environment that people would miss if they didn't know how productive it was and how important culturally it was and the sense of reverence that these people you know that you that you could uh, perceive from them as they entered a place where they made part of their living, right? And caught this culturally important resource, okay? So, uh, and then of course, uh, talking about, you know, we did, we did an interview and we took photos and so on and so forth. We asked them, you know, what are you gonna do with these land crafts? And they said, well, uh, we're gonna sell some of them and we're gonna separate some of them to give to friends and family. And yet we're gonna separate some of them to uh, throw a feast, what they call a huellada which is basically invite people over to your house to eat the land crabs, right? So uh, this experience with them, uh, the name were Frank and Juanita, right? Uh, to me illustrates uh, a lot the relationship of, of these coastal black Puerto Ricans and the landscape. Uh, because uh, right next to this pastizal, this abandoned area, which in fact is not abandoned, is highly productive, there was an announcement from the municipal government that they were about to take some of this area and basically destroy the mixed forest, the pastizal, fill it up with cement, and you know uh, uh, create. In this case, it was a, a small scale, uh, 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 you know, recreational tourist uh, development that it was going to bring, you know, however many jobs to to to, to the area, right? So uh, to me, this really illustrates the relationship of black people and the landscape in in 
in the Puerto Rican coast, but also in many other coasts like that over the world, right? In which, and many other areas that are not coastal, but basically in which, you know, Black Puerto Ricans, and, uh, you know, have been over time, you know, during enslavement and after enslavement and, and, you know, and many of the different ways in which Black people have interacted with the landscape, they have been forced in, you know, to these marginal areas or areas that were deemed marginal, areas that at the time were not uh, uh, desired, you know, uh, of course, all this, uh, there were, there's all this, uh, uh, prejudice or stereotypes about what, what mangroves have, you know, over the years as places of sickness or places that are harsh, etc. Which, which, of course, now we know they are not. But uh, they're forced to these areas that are deemed somehow undesirable, somehow marginal. And then when they are there, they, you know, develop an intimate knowledge of the landscape, sophisticated bodies of local ecological knowledge ways of, 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 you know, making, of extracting value or, or, or ways of not really extracting, but enacting value with the landscape, ways of even conserving the landscape, you know, in that particular uh, visit to the, to, to, to the forest, you know, I, we witnessed this land grabber saying, you know, picking and choosing which barrels he was going to place a trap in and telling me, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, we always have to leave some for tomorrow. So developing a conservation ethic, developing a sense of stewardship of these areas. And then, of course, what has happened with mangroves on all many coastal regions in Puerto Rico and elsewhere, suddenly they are not undesirable. Capitalist desire, you know, puts his sights on these areas. And now they have to fight to retain access to these areas. To They have to fight to ensure the conservation of these areas for themselves and their communities. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and again, you know, uh, uh, and so for me, you know, it's really a, 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 a microcosm, okay, of coastal Black Puerto Ricans' relationship with, uh, with their, their ecosystems, with their ecology, okay? Uh, it, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I think that was the anecdote that I wanted to share. Uh, uh, and that, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, and again, sorry for your loss. I think um, we're already really at um, thinking about, um, I think, Carlos, sure, um, your remarks really helped to sort of transition to um, another kind of question that I want to raise before we um, start to engage some of the comments that have come in, um, and that's really about um, the significance of Black ecologies, not only as sites of extraction and violence, but also as sites of possibility and futurity that are that um, that exceed a traditional kind of conservationism or other things that are tied to colonial management and um, and a sort of desire to you know, preserve certain natural resources only to then later exploit them, right? As opposed to um, this kind of vision that you started to lay out from the land crabbers where um, there's an intimate knowledge um, first and foremost um, that takes different forms. I think that's um, very important and specific um, to that landscape. Sometimes it takes the form of what we might consider the folk um, information, people have their own taxonomies and, and understandings for different plant and animal life. Um, and that also builds into this vision that, you know, for lack of better terms, really is, really does emphasize and underscore sustainability um, in a robust way that not only preserves um, a sort of population exterior to human life, but sees those as intimately bound. Um, and, and with the, especially with the anecdote um, that you mentioned, or the quote that you mentioned about, we need we need some for tomorrow, right? An organic, intellectual engagement with these landscapes. Um, I also um, so I wanted to raise that question for everyone, but I also um, since we um, unfortunately don't have Jillian McComas here, I wanted to just use a couple of seconds to just talk about the kind of black ecology that I'm thinking about um, and not these things together. Um, very much similar to everybody else, um, Tappahannock, Virginia, and the Tidewater in general of Virginia is um, a colonial site of extraction and plantation formation. Of course, notably, is the region of Jamestown. Um, so it's kind of old in relation to Anglo colonization um, of North America. And 
um, it is very much a, an intricate meeting of the land and the water, right? Um, it is rivery, it's tidal, um, and it leads all to the um, to the Chesapeake Bay, these large rivers. Um, so it's quite funny that I live in a desert now. I'm often shocked by what they call a river. I'm like, <laughs> that's a stream. Um, but anyway, so, um, so, but these are sites where extraction, violent extraction have been going on um, since the era in which um, tobacco cultivation was centered in the, that region. Um, one of the things that connects, um, and Justin and I have been thinking a lot, and we've written about, but also um, been thinking about um, sort of a larger project um, around mapping Black ecologies um, uh, is the ways that um, that these kinds of these kinds of um, places are connected, right? How places like New Orleans and um, and rural Virginia are connected, and one of those connections is very deeply historical, right? Um, one of those connections is the reality that in in the ante in the late antebellum period, Richmond, Virginia, and New Orleans were the two biggest um, slave uh, selling markets in the country, but for opposite reasons. Richmond was selling enslaved peoples in its largest numbers, extracting um, them and displacing them from tide water. You can't look at a WPA slave narrative and not see the ways that the threats of violence to be sold to New Orleans um, and the reality of being sold to New Orleans punctuated generations and their connections or disconnections with the landscape. Um, and of course, New Orleans, on the other hand, was a, a growing epicenter of slavery, especially in the hinterland up the Mississippi um, and into the Delta. And so many of the people, literally many of the people who um, who were forced to clear the Delta and other parts of New Orleans hinterland were also, had also generationally cleared um, the forest in Virginia. And I want to, I mean, you can look at plantation records and all of that and see that this was all, a, um, the diaspora was a site of ecological vulnerability from that period. I mean, Landon Carter, famous, you know, diarist of everything that he ever did, um, like many slave owners, um, they thought well, whatever they said was important. Um, but, you know, even his archive shows like, okay, uh, you know, a, a quote, Guinea ship came from Barbados and brought flies that destroy wheat or, um, or so you, we can see and, and smallpox and malaria and other kinds of things that were definitely tied to ecological vulnerability. Like, um, like you were mentioning, Carlos, and like I think is a thread through a lot of our work, is also the reality that Black communities um, at the margins, ecological environmental margins, also work to create, make these ecotones um, into something that had other possibilities. And whether that was marronage and running away and creating social orders um, outside of plantation domination, or whether that was a more quotidian relationship with the water um, or, and with the land and with different species, um, they developed these very, uh, these very um, elaborated senses and knowledges about the land and the, the processes of the land and the water. Um, and I think those are still alive and pro pro probably as well in many of the communities that we're discussing. Those aren't those didn't weren't eviscerated despite ongoing enclosure and displacement, but rather they were um, those bodies of knowledge continue. Um, I think about the ongoing ways in which black fishermen um, who have been totally displaced from large scale industrial fishing. Um, and at, at certain moments, like, for example, after the Civil War, when the Chesapeake becomes the chief supply of oysters, um, they, you know, they basically, Black people have been experts about oystering, right? Um, they then colonize that, extract all the oysters, and then leave, you know, I guess the oyster shells. <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing else uh, to it. So, um, but these commute, but the, they're continue to be all of these ways. And what I've been um, really looking at is the ways that commensality brings that together. And it sounds resonant, I know, with Hilda and Carlos, especially the ways that sharing food and and putting forward um, aesthetics around bountifulness, around um, around just being, just having the different flavors of a place mixed together on your plate 
like how those things are a um, are a very uh, in a very basic way um, in a very important way. And I don't mean basic in the sense of simple. I mean uh, fundamental, basic in the sense of fundamental way for us to think about black ecologies. Um, when people fry fish and when they do all of that, it entangles them within a certain kind of geography and ecology. Um, and and those are the kinds of knowledges that we can um, we can think rethink um, systems, small and large, I believe, through. Um, so I want to I want to with that said um, and with this sense that black ecologies are, in fact, ongoing extraction, dumping, um, deforestation, water rising and all of that. Um, I want us to also sort of open up other possibilities. What are the what are the kinds of ways that black ecology or black ecologies names alternatives? Um, and I guess what would the world look like if these kinds of networks, these organic mutual aid, uh, worlds of mutual aid and possibility, what would what would the world look like if they were the center? Um, I, could we we'll scramble it some. Um, could we start with Hilda and then Justin and Daniel? Oh, sorry, Carlos, I put you at the end again. <laughs> um, okay. Hilda, uh, Justin, Danielle, and then Carla. You're muted, Hilda. Oh, mute. Yeah. I know Carlos has to leave soon. So if you want to, if he wants to take five minutes to, to start this, Carlos. Oh, yes, that's right. And then, yeah. So then and I can. So, uh, but, I mean, you can go ahead. I can go after you. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, you already got started. So, yeah, yeah, that's. I get a little long winded. So, I want to make sure that <laughs> you have some time. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so in terms of, of what, so the contributions, right? And and uh, and JT, you already mentioned uh, some of some of it, right? And it's is um, the the sharing, right? Certainly, uh, the sharing of food and commensality in in culinary traditions, I think, are just a core feature uh, of of Black ecological cultural practices. And as I was listening to you, you know, describe uh, commensality in the in, in Virginia um, in frying, you know, when you mentioned frying fish, right? It was just like brought all these <laughs> these memories to to my mind, um, and some of which we Carlos and I both uh, have documented and are documented documenting in our work. But briefly, I'll just uh, tell you quickly that my uh, my family uh, are land grabbers. Um, and fisher folk, right? Um, and so uh, from this southeast coast of Puerto Rico, they're also gardeners. Uh, so people garden, people, you know, some people garden, some people fish, some people hunt land crabs, some people um, uh, uh, hunt and forage for um, what, what it's a, it's a type of shrimp in the river, right? So uh, there's, you know, the ecology that the, the and I think this is a core feature of Black ecologies, actually, uh, is that uh, that we can, I think, as, as Black people who have been dealing with uh, this possession on certain, you know, economic uncertainty, right, the uncertainties of, of, of hunger uh, in, a, in, you know, in a real sense, right, of actually going hungry, uh, because you can't, in a cash economy, right, post-emancipation, you know, if you didn't have cash, you couldn't really afford food, right? So one of the things, at least in the, in the context of, of the Caribbean, where my family is from and where I do this work, is that uh, looking, you know, people develop this, this way of looking at the landscape and being able to understand that it was uh, resource-rich, Right, and so and that that you didn't have to go hungry if you know if you knew what plant gave what food, right? The leaves, the 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 roots. We eat a lot of root vegetables, or you know that we knew that the mangroves had oysters and 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 crabs, and you know um, the coconut. You know, so you know there's just this whole vast resource resource rich 
a territory that I think is at the core of black ecology, right? The knowing how to harvest, the knowing how to store uh, this territory so that you could provide for yourself and your family. And this is really significant. And I think when I when you were uh, speaking, JT, I was thinking of the tradition, uh, you know, part of one of the, I mean, it, it depends how, you know, there's lots of ways to think about it, but, you know, the massive migrations of, of, of Black Puerto Ricans from the Southeast to the North, right, to the North of the United States specifically. Um, so people were leaving, you know, left the, the, the Southern tropical coast for for you know new york city for newark for camden for for hartford for boston jamaica plain and all of these places that you know one of the things that people if you look at the literature one of the things that people always comment on was you know how frigid it is and how you know for you know the length of time that people had to spend inside which was like a a torture, you know, because one thing about the Caribbean tropical, you know, folks is that one of the things we most enjoy in life is to be outside. Like this is, you know, this is also part of of uh, non exhaustion, non exhausting our bodies, you know, liming, hanging out outside and under the mango tree, whatever, just hanging out, you know, uh, talking, telling stories, whatever, just just there, quiet, doesn't matter, but just being outside. Um, and so coming to the north, you know, one of the things that that was, uh, I think, torturous was, you know, having to spend so much time inside. But right, uh, uh, some people, a lot of people, develop ways in which to harvest things from the from uh, northern spaces too. So people, you know, a bunch of people learn how to fish, right? Learn how to. Uh, plant gardens in the summer, uh, uh, you know, in the yard of their tenement buildings and so on and so forth. But all of this also meant that people were sharing, continuing the traditions of sharing. So if you went to fish, you know, if you, you know, like I did grew up in Hartford, you know, you fish in the Connecticut River, but that that's, you know, it's okay, but people like, you know, seafood in the sea. So people will go out and, you know, a couple of people will get in a car and go out to, to fish out of, you know, New London, Connecticut, and then, you know, come back and share that fish, right? It was a different kind of fish, but people were frying it and using the same condiments that they had been using back home, right? And so that's the kind of ways in which uh, Black ecologies, you know, uh, travel uh, up with the migration. Another way, and I think this is the, the I'll stop after this, but the, the one significant way was um, that when people went back to to their hometowns in Puerto Rico, and uh, thinking specifically about the Southeast, one of the features we found, and even in our, you know, in our ethnographic interviews with land crabbers, is a massive um, amount of land crabs that are being shipped through the USPS, actually, to northern cities. So Chicago, New York, Boston, you know, flow, you know, people are waiting, right, to get their land crabs in the mail. There's this whole, it's, it's a very uh, complicated process because, you know, you want to make sure they don't melt, you know, things don't melt and all that, <laughs> but people have it down and also through migration. So when, you know, and in fact, just recently uh, when I was in Puerto Rico, a family I interviewed about the, the impact of the coal ashes in, in, in their specific family, uh, one of the, they said, well, you live in Providence, right? And I was like, yeah. And the, the, the mom said, you know, um, my son lives in, my oldest son lives in Providence. Can you take these land crabs back with you to give him? <laughs> now, I never met this man. I didn't even know, you know, that there was other people from my region here, you know, so, and it was, it was like, oh my God, yeah, sure. You know, it's like, I'm talking to my mom. Like if I go to the island, if she goes to the island, she brings back, you know, one suitcase is full of fish, lobster and crabs and, and, and also herbs for uh for healing for teas right so so that's how you know the ecology the, the black ecology travels in spaces and also people you know learn to forage in the new ecologies in which they're forced to live so i'll, I'll just stop there uh, carlos did you want to um add to that about that <laughs> yeah i mean uh uh, uh... One one thing uh, uh, that you know, which which again dovetails with everything that that you were saying right before Hilda and what Hilda has been saying, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, you know, 
in these current times, uh, this, uh, you know, let me just backtrack a little. As a local ecological knowledge researcher, uh, one of the things that gives me the most pleasure in the world is when the latest knowledge that gets polished in science or nature or the latest fat that everybody's into for a better life, for a better world, basically goes back to mirror what, you know, what, what the dispossessed in their various guises or their, their various forms have been telling us all along, you know, of how to live life in this world from a dispossessed perspective or, or from a non-greed, non-extractive capitalist perspective or a non-growth model or, or, you know, steady state, whatever you want to call it, right? So, for example, when they came up with the steady state economics as the big thing of how to have an economy and live and not destroy the planet, uh, of course, I mean, I have, you know, probably thousands of hours of interviews with fishermen and land grabbers and others basically saying in their own words the same, you know, the same tenets, the same principles, the same practices, sometimes even more advanced because they have a longer time perspective of what they now call steady state economics and publishing science or whatever, right? Uh, uh, so as ecological economists, et cetera. So for me, that's, um, of course, this kind of convergence of what they have been telling us all along of how to live life is, is a great source of pleasure. And, in, in, you know, from that perspective, the, the, the thing that I want to add is that, uh, you know, uh, Black Puerto Ricans, Black Coastal peoples, you know, that I have been working with over all these years, now it's 17 years counting, really, you know, uh, 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 hold a blueprint for maintaining cultural diversity, for maintaining humanity, for just surviving in this world that, I mean, I, I don't want to say that now, you know, now we, we need, we use it because we need it, you know, et cetera, because that's extractive and there's so many problems with that, but, you know, that we can, that we definitely, everybody needs to honor that perspective and how it was developed and the kind of like, uh, you know, the, the lessons to be learned, you know, and, 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 but basically, I mean, in a way, you know, what I've been trying to, in my own work, grapple with, and I'm writing a book, you know, with this as one of the central tenets is, okay, you know, uh, looking at the lives of dispossessed people as uh, what Fred Moten recently called in a, in a talk that I heard, you know, brilliantly called, you know, as, you know, looking at people's lives as experimental critiques to the idea of state capitalism, you know? Uh, uh, and, and I think, you know, I think that for, for me at least, and, and I think that's one of the next big frontiers, you know, uh, you know, these are, you know, there's so much knowledge out there and there's there's so many lives and so much suffering and, and, and you know, and et cetera, that has gone towards building these perspectives uh, that I, I don't know, we need to somehow honor and center and learn from them. And, you know, that that's it. And, and I, I need to leave shortly after this to pick up my son, but uh, I, I thank everybody for this opportunity to share this, these ideas and to learn from you. Thank you so much. Um, could we, Justin, could we turn it over to you on the question of um, the ways, the other side of Black ecology? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think about, you know, the history of, of kind of, of Black life, particularly in Southern Louisiana. And there's a book I've been reading called The Fear of French Negro by Sarah Johnson. And this is kind of, I, I was sharing with Hilda a bit about how in my work, I think through New Orleans as, of course, a U.S. Southern geography, but also as a, a circum-Caribbean geography as well. And in many ways, you know, the austerity, the structural adjustment that happened to the area post-2005 really can think back to the structural adjustment in the Caribbean in the 1980s as well. Um, but I think about the history of, of Black insurgent and, and Black radical world making that has happened in Louisiana. And I think that I realized this from working with activists who are kind of who will cite the German Coast Rebellion of the 1800s as a time in which, OK, that was when Black politics really did what it had, what it had to be done. In which you have, you know, kind of a, a caravan of enslaved people raising plantations and making their way down the German coast to the city of New Orleans. And they weren't successful. They didn't make it to New Orleans, but they left the trail of fire along the way. I think that in many ways, people like, as Carlos was saying, those kind of radical experimental critiques of state capitalism. You know, thank you for that and for Fred Moten for thinking through that, because I think in many ways, that's what black life, particularly that kind of insurgent black life in Louisiana has tried to do. Um, because in many ways, 
there's a recognition that we are in the belly of the beast of capital, of state capital, monopoly capital. And part of it is that, you know, it's hard to imagine alternative ways of thinking and knowing within that kind of like matrix of domination. And I think that part of the way that, and I think that we see those critiques and those experiments happen kind of on the quotidian level, but also kind of on, on the more, you know, activist and political level um, throughout the history of New Orleans. And it goes back to the 1800s, it goes into the, the UNIA, um, New Orleans had kind of one of the biggest United Negro Improvement Association memberships in, in, in the world, actually, in the 1920s, when Marcus Garvey actually was deported to Jamaica. You know, Black people in Louisiana line from Plaquemines Parish down to St. Bernard Parish. They lined the levees to kind of see Marcus Garvey off because they were such an investment in kind of like a radical Black political mobilization that tied Black life to not just what's happening in the U.S., but also Africa and also the Circum-Caribbean as well in, in the Black Atlantic world. So that goes back into the 1920s. And you have Queen Mother Moore in New Orleans with reparations and thinking through how to get reparations for slavery. So in many ways, I think about how kind of the, the political, the, the critique of state capital, you know, um, in many ways, I think that New Orleans isn't really seen as a note of kind of the civil rights movement writ large in terms of, you know, there weren't really any important things that had mobilizations that happened in the city of New Orleans that are kind of known across the country and are kind of lore of what the civil rights movement was. But that kind of insurgent black radical politics definitely existed in New Orleans because of its location as a plantation geography. So now I think about black feminist organizing that's happening in New Orleans now, particularly women with the vision. Um, gallery of the streets and about how in many ways there's a kind of a critique of post Katrina um in many ways they frame it as ethnic cleansing in a sense and the fact that you know since Hurricane Katrina over 96,000 black people were never able to return to the city and I think that in many ways kind of some of the black women activists in New Orleans now are thinking through kind of what are the kind of epistemological and also symbolic losses of that many black people and then how do you, how, and I think in my own work, I'm thinking through this as well, how do you kind of square away the fact that, you know, for New Orleans and for Southern Louisiana, the, it, it, similar to Puerto Rico, the tourism industry is what anchors it, right? And part of, you know, what anchors it in New Orleans is the fact that you need that kind of symbolic extraction of Black culture, Black working class and low income Black culture. That's why you go to New Orleans for the food, you go for the music. That, but how is there a, sim a, a simultaneous death drive to kill those same black people at the same time as you need to extract that symbolic power from the expressive culture to make your city viable for tourism? And I think that's the thing that I'm thinking through in that tension in my own work. And I think that's where many of the critiques of how do you fight against this system now, if it's through sabotage, is through, OK, how do you disrupt then that extractive tourism industry? How do you dis how do you kind of obstruct, particularly in schools? A critique of curriculums in, in charter schools is that you're preparing kids to enter not college, not a four year college, or even a two year college, but really the service sector in New Orleans. You're preparing kids to do that labor. How do you interrupt that in schools? How do you find ways to interrupt that kind of pipeline? How do you find ways to interrupt the carceral state in Louisiana? Because Louisiana also has, until last year, Oklahoma replaced it. But prior to last year, Louisiana had the highest incarceration rate of any state in the United States, in the most carceral country you know, on the planet. So then how do you interrupt an arrest and kind of, you know, arrest to use that word, arrest that process of the school to prison apparatus as it happens in New Orleans, too? So in many ways, kind of like, you know, there's there's no kind of one program for how do you how do you kind of destroy monopoly capital in the United States? But kind of these different ways of kind of organizing against and sabotaging the prerogatives of that kind of racial that racial economic system of domination, that's what I see happening in New Orleans. And I think that history goes back to those folks in 1811, you know, who came from the Haitian Revolution, from San Domingue, who came to New Orleans and then kind of stirred up the people who were already here and started to revolt against the planter class, you know, in, in the 1800s. So that history of kind of seeing the planter class as kind of like a, a political economic block that we must fight against is very is known on a very visceral level amongst people in New Orleans and that are also part of creating those kind of insurgent modes of citizenship that I try to think about in my own work. Thank you so much. Um could we um turn it over to Danielle on this matter? Yeah, thank y'all so much. Wow. Um there's, yeah, so many um, threads to kind of pick up on. Um, and I wanted to kind of think from like what everyone said. Um, I wanted to, I'm really happy that Justin um, brought into the space kind of um, Black feminist approaches um, to 
Black ecologies are this kind of building of sort of what Carlos was quoting um, uh, Moton on about experimental critiques of state capitalism. Um, and then also, you know, what Hilda is talking about, these sort of traveling Black ecologies um, and what um, the kind of relationship, right, of Black folks to uh, to land, to things that are not seen as resources, right, or commodities. Um, and kind of thinking about that um, in terms of, you know, as I've been um, kind of drawn more and more into um, the this sort of literature and kind of political legal understandings of towns, um, it's been really important to, um, and I think this kind of gets at one of the questions um, that someone was asking about um, sort of reinstantiating something around like black and in inferiority and, and those sorts of things. I think one of the things that, um, that is difficult about um, how, where we find ourselves, right? And um, within academies is that there is um, there are systems that are normalized and naturalized, right? And our work, um, if it doesn't do the work of denormalizing or denaturalizing systems, um, can do that work of um, reinforcing um, these kinds of ideas. Um, and I think like that gets kind of at the heart, I think, of what we're trying to do right today, right, is to say that there is an otherwise, right? There always has been, and like it's actually always being practiced. Um, and so when I think about, you know, one of the kind of core, I don't know, I want to say conclusions, right, that I've kind of come to in my own work is like um, how I want to get away from talking about Black towns as towns, right? Because that structure really, um, is right a, a structure that is embedded in racial capitalism embedded in uh, the plantation itself right and what you're seeing right not only because right um you know the fact of black towns as they were not never sort of attaining the same kind of um, resourcefulness and growth right and extractive growth right um that you see with um with white towns and cities um, is kind of an is, is sort of one indication that this is a different kind of space, but the more important, I think, indication is actually the practices that are happening on the ground, right? Um, and so this um, this sort of non-extractive, right, decommodified relationship to land that I've seen in pretty much every black space or sort of historic black founded space that I have ever been to from Institute West Virginia to Whitehall, Alabama, to um, Princeville, North Carolina, um, to Taylortown, North Carolina, um, to parts of Oklahoma um, has really, um, you know, the, the centering of um, relationship to land in terms of nourishment right in terms of medicine right um even in you know i live in durham and i'm from durham north carolina and i've actually also lived um, in uh new orleans post katrina for for three years and so even in these spaces that we don't think of as um black founded spaces in the kind of sense right but where there's um large black tradition and black communities um throughout it's a really um incredible right like um stories of even just black neighborhoods you know people telling you kind of stories of over and over and over again of the same kinds of spaces right um you know everywhere like literally in every single place when i've interviewed someone or just had a conversation with someone who's from a historic black area either within a white city or um a sort of more independent black space um the orchards right the fisheries right the um um the like the herbal remedies like it is a it is a constant right and it doesn't matter kind of where i am right kind of geographically that that is um a persistent way of relating to um 
Relating to land and, you know, uh, um, JT used the terminology around like mutual aid. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is like there are um, political and social institutions that are manifested in these places that um, don't map onto anything, right, that is recognized by sort of white capitalist state structures, right? Um, and this is really important for thinking about, you know, all of these questions that are arising now, particularly in like local government law and, and some forms of, it's, I wouldn't say black geographies, but like conversations about creating independent black space, the question around like whether to incorporate as a municipality, right? And what does it mean to like create that kind of, um, import that kind of structure, right, into this space? And, 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 you know, part of my work has been trying to understand like how like how incompatible, right? like structurally incompatible, right? Like those systems are. And what ends up happening is that the narrative around it is as a kind of failed state. And it's not that, right? It's that it was never meant, right? These spaces were never meant to be created in this particular kind of way, um, not only from the perspective, perspective of white folks, but that's also not, right? Like historically how um, black communities have operated in relationship to each other. So there's always this sort of both and that you're kind of, um, yeah, trying to like both argue. And so, yeah, just sort of kind of taking away, right? Taking these black spaces out of the realm of the town and, and, and not um, having that be the kind of referent, right? In which are sort of the context in which we're talking about them. Um, I think really helps to anchor our conversation and then also right to denaturalize and denormalize like this town structure or this sort of political geographic structure as like the way that space is created right. Um, so yeah, you know, and I, I think there's um, a ton right to. Um, you know, I, a lot of my work, like, you know, is starting to think about like how we think about law and policy, right? Like how do you operate, right? Like inside, even if you're, you know, removing yourself from that context, you're still within that context, right? And so how are you relating to things like laws and policies and um, what are the various approaches to kind of trying to sustain your space, right? So um, over time, and I think, you know, one of one of the things that's been really important to me um, to, to, to really understand is um, there's an approach to, um, and this, I think this is important for thinking about, you know, when communities are fighting off hazards, right? When communities are trying to um, work to preserve space, there is a, um, invocation of law, right? There is an invocation of policy. Um, but a lot of that like comes from a, a lens that is not a, um, a, legitim a legitimization, right, of law and policy, but an understanding that like, we use this as a means of like, harm reduction within this system that is wholly incompatible with us. We don't think that it's legitimate, but it is like what um, one of the things that we have to kind of bring forward and we don't have a whole lot of hope in it. Right. But it is a step, right? It is one thing that we can do. Um, and, um, yeah, so I just, I think like, that's one of the things that's been really important of, you know, to think about, um, what is being, what is being created all the time? You know, I think people send me articles a whole, like, all the time about um, uh, just recently, right? The 19 black folks in Georgia who just bought a whole bunch of land, we're gonna create a town, right? And I was just like, all right, here we go, right? Cause we're like in another, we're like in, you know, round whatever, you know, like of this sort of black um, space making to kind of as an exit, right? As like one means of a, um, a, a kind of exit or whatever kind of exit black, folks in this country like can try to create for themselves and you know all of the kind of implications and questions and what people are bringing with themselves here um i think the last thing i and i, and I think that's really like carrying those histories and um 
and these ideas are so important. I think for those folks, right, like as a very practical matter, right, like as they are really thinking through what the future of their space is. Um, and, you know, Black feminism, I think, has a lot, right, to do with um, trying to um, pivot around and denaturalize, right, this sense that, oh, we need to create this sort of box for ourselves. We need to create a town. Um, I think that that's a really important part of this. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, Justin, you, you, you're um, just really, really incredibly rich work about um, New Orleans post-Katrina and its sort of linkages to this like very long, right, like multi-century, right, like history. Um, um, of extraction and um, and uh, ro black revolts and those sorts of things. One of the things that I think, um, and because New Orleans is the place that where I really kind of got started in this work, um, really thinking about environmental justice and then kind of getting to black geographies and black ecologies. Um, what brought me there um, was actually. Um, when I was working, I was working for the city, um, for the Office of Recovery that was kind of created as a like ancillary body to the city after the storm. And I was working in their infrastructure and environmental planning department. And one of the things that um, I was on the phone every day with people, some of these, you know, 96,000 people who weren't able to return um, about their flood insurance claims, about all of these sorts of things. And then we were approached by a whole bunch of folks who were like, mostly Black folks who are like, you know, in New Orleans, we plant kitchen gardens. This city sat underwater for two weeks, right? What is the condition of my soil? I want to get back to my garden, right? Um, what can you tell us? What sort of resources do you have for us? Like, we know that y'all are, you know, creating this 10-year ecological plan about solar energy or whatever, I don't know about that. I don't know about what is going to happen with that, but I do know that I'm back here and I want to be in my garden, right? What are you going to tell me about this soil, right? And so one of my, um, yeah, my kind of introduction to um, Black ecologies really in that space was this demonstration garden project that the city ended up sponsoring about, you know, what, how people can get their soil tested, how people can know that they are safe, Right. Um, we had an idea at one point about like a community creating community based laboratories where folks could get tested so it wouldn't have to be through like the agricultural extension of the university. But um, the bottom line was like that was the scale right that was the you know sort of center around where I saw most black folks who were engaging in these conversations about the ecological future of the city right was really um, centered around. Uh, the local, how do we continue to take care of ourselves and our communities, right? And this is a fundamental way for us to do that. Um, so yeah, that was a really um, powerful kind of introduction from me into um, this kind of work. And um, I'm excited to kind of keep going um, with y'all with that. Thanks. I think um, that's, you highlight, Danielle, something that's really important is, you know, I use the word um, mutual aid, but there are these long and extensive traditions of, um, as everybody's been talking through, um, I think when you were speaking, it reminded me of Huey Newton, right, um, uh, in terms of intracommunalism and this notion that, you know, in the face of monopoly and technocracy, like, uh, how do we get to an alternative and very much, you know, after sort of moving through different forms of nationalism came to the notion of intracommunalism. I think, you know, it's often remarked upon as like a way of helping to make sense of the um, of the turn to survival, which is seen as retrenchment from a more, quote unquote, more radical posture. But the Panthers, you know, that that resonates with a lot of folks around in in everyday ordinary ways. Like, how do we survive and how do we um, thrive and how do we um, how do we know that we how do we know in a small local way what's safe and how do we um, how do we fish? How do we continue to fish? I think about the Anacostia River in D.C., which I've written some about, you know, in the colonial period, it was navigable to Bladensburg, Maryland. 
you know, you can't even get in the mouth at this point because of deforestation. And, you know, since oil modernity is toxic, right? Um, but people continue to fish in it. So even though, even though like 20% in the early 2000s of the, um, of the introduced catfish species have cancer, people still eating that. But yet we see within the, the world that people create even through what we might consider contaminated stuff, like the possibilities for other kinds of worlds and futures. And they're very much local. I mean, they, as Danielle, and I think, you know, Newton, and then also, as y'all were pointing to, um, Black feminist theorists, June Jordan and other po folks who are also trying to think about how do we, um, and I'm riffing off Danielle in another conversation, how do we anneal, um, you know, intra-communal divides um, generationally, but also between rural and urban communities. I want to, um, we've seen, uh, Danielle, you you like on point because I feel like the major questions that popped up from our audience, um, you already addressed um, explicitly. Um, I see, um, I see some other um, questions that have started to emerge and we do want to open it up for folks um, in larger conversation, I see one from David asking recently about how um, ideas about black ecologies relate to um, the African context. Um, I think, I mean, I think we can draw on those histories as well. I, I'll take a personal stab at it. I've been reading some about Thomas Sankara um, and, uh, and particularly through Amber Murray's uh, recent edited volume. Um, but, you know, I mean, many of the not only the 60s and 70s generations of anti-colonialists, but also later um, folks who were facing neo and neo-colonialism and neoliberalism were committed to land reform. Right. <laughs> were committed to um, the Burkina Bay uh, revolution was committed to the transformation of rural land. Right. Um, and also the forest planting. So I think there is, um, there needs to be, um, as you know, we move forward with black ecologies, more engagement with um, these questions. I also think there's a historical, I think when I think about the context of Virginia um, and, you know, and the kinds of work that enslaved peoples did to survive that landscape, part of what they did was, um, engaging African ingenuity around how to how to live in a landscape. And that, I think that's parallel very much in what Hilda was describing earlier um, in terms of these movement, um, the movement of black ecologies. Um, they do they are um, they do have antecedents in connections to the continent. Um, and I think we could think about that in relation to um, religious and other kinds of um, expressive cultural and life. Um, you know, the, the turn in the wider diaspora to certain Orishas, for example, um, the ocean and the river Orishas over, say, the war making Orishas was very much, it was a cosmological transformation based on the reality that, you know, maybe you had come from a state that used to enslave and sell slaves, and now you now you the person sold, or now you the group sold. Um, and what I so I think there are all kinds of historical and ongoing ways that we could think about how Black ecologies move between the continent um, and to Black communities in the Americas and in the wider diaspora. Um, so I think um, I think another question that we might I think uh, Danielle, you already started to get at this. But another question that we might um, think about is where where does I guess where does what we're talking about in terms of ecologies vibe with the kind of notion of political ecologies um, in general? Um, and I think Danielle, I'll um, I'll open that question to you um, first if you're willing, because I think what you're saying around towns um, and what you're saying around these kinds of political structures and moving outside of them very much does speak to. Um, where ecology and political ecology, um, where there's a rub. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Daniel, if that's cool. Sure. Um, I guess just briefly, I'll say, you know, when I was introduced to political ecology, I think one of the things that was exciting to me um, that I thought that um, 
um, was missing from some, like, so there were things that I was steeped in sort of environmental justice, um, literature, environmental, um, literature around environmental racism and coming to political ecology. Um, I saw that sort of here were two, um, here were two fields that uh, were very much connected to one another that had not been connected. And one of the things, one of the reasons, um, one of the things that I, well, I think actually sort of racialization process is an actual, um, in, in the disciplines in our fields, right? Like actually um, have, uh, contributed to some of that. Um, but I also think one of the strengths of environmental justice and environmental racism literature that wasn't in, that I didn't find in political ecology um, was the attention to race and racialization, right? And one of the strengths of political ecology that I think could have been strengthened, right, in the environmental justice literature um, was attention to kind of broader structures of power, right? So there's um, there's sort of a difference in kind of talking about um, racial disparities um, and sort of uh, theorizing, right, about race and sort of larger power racial capitalist structures. Um, and 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 that was something that I thought was missing, right, from environmental justice literature. And in political ecology, um, there is such as uh, there are, there has been right such a, an emphasis on um, capitalism, sort of Marxist um, uh, I, ideas around um, around power. I think that, um, uh, and I think there's you know increasingly more on kind of racial capitalism that's that is. Um, that's being uh, put out in, in under political ecology, but that was something that I thought was was missing from those two fields. So I would actually love to see um, more, and I think it's starting to happen, and it's happening in some of my work, right? That kind of bridge happening between um, uh, those two bodies of of literature, um, and I think you know the ideas of um, ecologies uh, that I think, though at least the way that, and I can't speak for other folks, but at least the way that I'm thinking about it um, in my work is really um, thinking through both how, um, like, <laughs> almost kind of like a uh, the history of the discipline kind of approach of thinking about how an ecosystem is constructed um, uh, through environmental science, through environmental politics, literatures, right, which are like still very white and still um, uh, absent power in a lot of ways, right, like from the literature, even if it's about politics. Um, uh, and I think um, really thinking about, you know, for black ecologies um, in particular, right? Like, um, as we were talking about earlier, right? Like getting away, right? From um, that construction of an ecosystem and sort of trying to, um, yeah, redirect about, you know, thinking about what, what is happening on the ground, what we are observing in black communities and how their relationship um, right, uh, to place, right, to where they are, right, um, differs and how that might lead us to a different definition of an ecology or an ecosystem, um, if that makes sense. Thank you. We have another, uh, oh, Justin, did you want to jump in? I, I kind of, I wanted to connect the, the both questions about Africa as well as political ecology um, with a kind of a, a story, um, because I think that part of you know, me thinking through my own work is kind of to have a really a diachronic understanding of the historical layers that kind of, you know, have have structured what what we what we're kind of articulating and analyzing now. But I think as an anthropologist, of course, being trained, you know, in archaeology and in biological anthropology and cultural anthropology too, I think that I've been interested as well in thinking about this kind of idea of the Anthropocene. It kind of like what are the kind of political underpinnings of the idea of the Anthropocene? And I was at a talk with an archaeologist actually who did work in Malawi. 
Um, and she's an archaeologist who does work in Malawi back into, you know, in early in the early human period. So like 100,000 years ago in, in Malawi. And part of what her project was to figure out, OK, the Anthropocene is, of course, inherently a, a political kind of, you know, way of defining an, an era. And she was trying to think through, OK, in the long array of kind of like human life on the planet, how to, when does the Anthropocene actually begin? And some folks say it began, of course, you know, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. With with those atomic bomb, you know that that was the era. Some folks are saying industrial revolution is where it began, and it was it was interesting in her work because she was looking back at speciation, so kind of like species diversity in Malawi in like the early human period, and about when humans first began to kind of first use and wield fire. The carbon footprint of that led to massive speciation immediately in Malawi and East Africa, and this was hundred thousand years ago. So I think so when I saw when I saw that talk, I was thinking about, OK, the long array of it. But also I was like, OK, so now you have NGOs going to Malawi to tell Malawians how to sustainably farm and how to best, you know, how to best kind of, you know, kind of undo the kind of political and economic um, destruction of colonialism by NGOs, now liberal NGOs now saying that, OK, but look, Africans have always been bad stewards of the land because even back into early human origins, the, for, that was when the things first really happened was that's when the, the Anthropocene began. And that's why I think thinking through Francois Ver's idea of like the racial capitalist scene, that's why I thought that was so productive, because in many ways, you know, people, archaeologists can kind of think back to, OK, the first human imprint that kind of caused massive kind of the kind of speciation. But let's not use that to kind of say, OK, now we're all bad stewards of the land as human beings, period. So that we all need to learn new things. And I think that in many ways that kind of the the racial ordering of archaeology and who gets to do what work where and also how that work becomes framed as a part of kind of framing this as kind of an issue of the human or, you know, man and not an issue of global capital, monopoly capital and its extractive kind of quality. So I think in many ways that archaeological work made me think about, OK, the ways in which kind of people are trying to find diachronic understandings of how humans have kind of converted and transformed kind of ecology globally. But also it's like, no, but let's think through racial capitalism as well. And let's think through colonialism and imperialism as a particular kind of ratcheting up of those human processes and not kind of lay this out as like, oh, racism has been here since the beginning of time. So what can we do about it? It's kind of like the same kind of throw your hands up thing. And I'm thinking, no, let's think particularly about the ways that colonization and imperialism um, have driven so much of what's happening now and kind of can help us understand the political economy, what's happening in Africa now, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, extraction, exploitation, degradation, less so than just we're all human beings who don't know how to be good stewards of the environment. Right. Thank you for that. Um, definitely. I want to turn um, probably to what will be our last um, question um, raised by um, someone from our audience about patriarchy. Um, we've been talking about the way that black um, uh, black feminism um, and other and other modes are um, are part of the work to unmake this kind of ecological condition and, and marginalization of black um, of black communities. So I want to I want to just open that up. Where does um, where does patriarchy fit into this um, into along with white supremacy? and other kinds of um, hierarchies, where do they fit together um, in this? Um, and I'll say just from my work in relation to Virginia, I mean, you can't get to the kinds of violent extractionism without the metaphors and real, um, real uh, ways that that planters and settlers view um, the land is, as potentially pregnant, impregnable, or however you might say that, <laughs> um, how they view, and then also, of course, to keep it short, also how they view um, and retooled juridically um, Black women's bodies, in particular, enslaved Black women's bodies, um, to be, to produce an enslaved um, uh, set of people that could then clear, further clear forests and all of that, right? So the ways that it, um, the ways that white patriarchal domination is founded in it's it's part of the founding scene of um of racial capitalist violence and if we go with the racial capitalist scene vision the ways that that um that connects but i you know i want to open it up where do where does patriarchy where does fighting patriarchy center in our kind of notion of um of 
of undoing the kinds of um, processes that continue to displace and um, and harm, particularly black people. And just so we have a um, a timestamp, uh, we have about ten minutes, so <laughs> um, we we gotta we gotta watch the clock. Let me see. Okay, I'll I'll just say a couple of things about this and patriarchy, and I I'll echo what you said, JT, which is about this conception of the land as uh, feminized, uh, especially particularly right. Uh, uh, black land specifically, right? Because then we, we have to start, you know, in the case of a place and in the US, the Americas, you know, we have to really think about, and I, I make, for you, I think in some ways for some of you here, um, it's easy, right, to say black ecologies and to, right? And that is and that is a place people understand it in the context of the, of the US, right? But in the Americas, in a place like Puerto Rico, it's much harder, you know, to say black ecologies and for people to, to say, oh yeah, yeah, that place. We know, we know which, which towns because right this because part of the ways in which in the in the um, global America in the Southern Americas, Caribbean and, and particularly the, the Spanish uh, colonial Americas that racism and anti-black racism has worked is by essentially uh, erasing you know this idea that erasing blackness altogether from from the territory. Right, which is this is a whole another conversation. However, uh, so even when I say when I say black ecology in, in Puerto Rico, you know, I'm already pushing against some understandings that there isn't such a thing, right? So I'm, I'm already making a kind of critique. But but I've been, you know, this is uh, the kind the critique I've been making uh, in terms of of race in Puerto Rico for uh, 20 years now so it, it is it is what i do and and uh and in part is because i come from a black ecology as i mentioned before right so you know when people challenge my view it's like well okay that's that's all good and well but i'm looking from you know my eyes are uh looking and are built by the blood of my ancestors and are and are built by the specific kind of landscape from which I come. So when I'm looking at up, when I'm looking out, I'm looking from the plantation. Like that's that's where I am. That's it. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, if people think the plantation is over, it isn't, and that's where I'm looking from out at the world. Um, and so the 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 plantation, right, as a feminized territory, which is something black feminists uh have been saying for you know a very very long time not only in the united states but in the in brazil right there's all this literature written uh, by black feminists uh in brazil i think that is incredibly useful um and in the black um the feminization of the of the black territory is one of the the things that that they have uh, said very well in the United States. You know, you have McKittrick and of course Hartman and and many others who've been talking about this now for some time. Winter, of course, right, uh, and many many others. Um, the other thing in terms of patriarchal domination, I also often think about like white feminist claims to to the to being allowed to work. Right to 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 joining the the paid uh, salaried uh, workforce, uh, and, and it's interesting because you know black theories, black feminist theories, have said, well, that's not you know we 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 were actually you know laborers like this is what we do, this is what we've been forced to do. So <laughs> if anything, we have to you know fight for our right to non-exhaustion, which is something that Francois uh, Vergenz talks about, right? Non-exhaustive bodies, right? So I don't want to fight to work. This is what I what I was brought here to do, and in in many ways, uh, it's unpaid. You know, it, it's it's a and this is a whole other conversation, but. You know the the currency of black women's work uh it first of all is not always understood as work and second of all the currency is not always money so right that that's something that we also need need to think about when we think about um uh fem you know the kinds of feminist claims that that are made and that that people want to make um so i'll, I'll leave it at that i mean there's so much more to say but i'll just um and somebody i see a, something in the chat about Somebody quoted the Hugh Newton's quote the, about the "we are all lump and proletariat," which I really like because when when people push me to say, "Well, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, 
the the region in Puerto Rico from which I come from, it's an anarchist, it, you know, it's an anarchist tradition there in uh, pirating and buccaneering and smuggling. And so this is a region in which people also like to hide from the state. So there's that other piece that's happening as well. We are not trying to be, you know, making, you know, we're not trying to be so close to the state because then they can, you know, incarcerate, incarcerate us, which is another thing to think about in terms of how it, it all works to some degree. Um, but when people push me to in Marxist to think about, oh, you know, your class structure in Marxist terms, I have always said, you know, and, and my this is true, my family is Lompe proletariat. That's who we are. And we're making, and the claims I make also come from that position, right? Which is supposedly this anti-politics, anti-revolutionary uh, uh, position, but it's actually exactly the opposite. Uh, I think in many ways, it's just subterranean in some ways. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. I know, I don't know if any of it made sense, but yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll stop. We appreciate you. Yeah, no, I can <laughs> think that's part of it is like how we think about, um, I think similarly in Virginia, ain't nobody trying to be incorporated. And we looking at the solar, the new solar stuff that it came and replaced the farm in the same, with the same skepticism that we uh, mm -hmm. did the plantation and every other iteration of it. Cause it's not for us at the end of the day, it's about extraction and ongoing violence. And it doesn't, um, and green commercialism doesn't, or any of these other modes, mm -hmm. conservationism, they don't, um, they don't respect black life. And so, um, so black people entangling themselves further with that is probably not um not gonna ever be the move I and mean, i think danielle and, and justin your work as well really highlight these um very similar uh points of connection and also disavow in relation to black people in the state and, and larger systems um given what's going on um so i think we're at we're at the full sort of capacity of our time together um i want to thank you all so much um i really do um feel like at home with y'all in a way that um i have lots of intellectual friends and activists and organizers and ordinary people friends but i really do feel like um this has been an opportunity in the last few months to really um, to really find community. Um, so I really appreciate you all and I look forward to our continued conversations. Um, we also want to thank the Pollen folks. Um, this is our first, this is at least my first um, um, time engaged and this has really been awesome. Um, so thank you so much, um, everyone. And I will, uh, do we just close out? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure what we do now. Um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can just close out and then then we can leave. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, again, and thank you to our audience for your great questions and all of that as well. Oh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, JT and everybody. This has been really, really great.